Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another uh, edition of Education Matters with Jim O'Connell. Uh, very happy you could join us. If you're watching us live, it is uh, Tuesday afternoon, the 3rd of, uh, of October, and uh, if you are watching at this hour, uh, just to remind you, I think it should be on the screen, but the call-in number is 640-3091, and... Um, We'd, uh, we'd be very happy to uh, uh, welcome you, uh, welcome your calls, thoughts, ideas, etc. Um, I'm very pleased today to have a, a friend of mine and uh, uh, a semi-neighbour um, who's running for office in Ward 1. Um, uh, and so I'm going to throw it over to, uh, to uh, Chris Stewart, who's, uh, who's uh, running in Ward 1 for... Um, well, there isn't a party designation. I leave it to you, Chris. I'll see you. Let, Jim, let, let us people know what, what, what's going on. Uh, good evening, Jim. It's nice to be here. Thank you so much for letting me talk to your audience. Uh, hello at home, people. My name is Chris Stewart. I am in Ward 1. I am running for Alderman. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here and talk with Jim about education and all the other issues that are important to the city of Manchester. So thank you for having me on the show. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And, you know, uh, I, most of you probably know uh, anybody who pays attention to politics in Manchester. Um, Chris is a former uh, school board member in, the, in for War 3, correct? Um, and uh, served a couple of terms, Chris? Was I did. I, I, uh, I served two terms. I, I should say I almost served, to, served two terms. I was uh, re-elected and then, well, let me back up. So, again, my name is Chris Stewart, and right. uh, I'm from southern Vermont originally. Uh, I moved to Manchester in 2004. I uh, met my then-girlfriend, Sarah Crawford. We lived downtown for a couple of years. Uh, we had a modest little condo on West Merrimack Street. And then we moved over to 1200 uh, Elm Street, the apartment buildings. I got married. I got elected to the Manchester School Board, served two terms, uh, had a couple kids, and decided that we needed to move out of the apartment that we were living in. And so we moved up to Ward 1 a couple of years ago. I have uh, three children, Edward, who's five, almost five, and my twin girls, Macy and Katie, who just turned three. Uh, and I threw my hat in the ring here for Alderman, but I, I did. I served almost two terms uh, on the Manchester Board of School Committee representing Ward 3. So let me, I, I know why I start here. As I told you just before we came on air, I don't, have, uh, I don't have a list of particular questions because if I were to start with that, I'd have a list, you know, the length of a, a couple of fool's cap pages. So, um, so I, I'll just uh, come at them as they, as they occur in the conversation. But uh, you, you're, you're, so your oldest uh, son, um, is he in kindergarten now? So Edward, who is going to turn five in December, missed the cutoff date. He's over in daycare on the west side, loves it, St. Peter's, wonderful institution. The wonderful St. Peter's, It is yeah. amazing. Sister Florence is an awesome, awesome person. Right. My wife and I can't say enough good things about that operation. Uh, he will be starting Webster next September. And nice. the girls, because uh, they're late September in the way the cutoff works, they'll be, even though they're two years younger than him, they'll be one year behind him at Webster as well. Right, excellent. Um, so, so one other, sorry, and sorry, we're going to sort of uh, <coughs> scattergraphic and sort of little pieces of time here. But so one other thing is sort of the, as, as a baseline thing. So family man in Manchester, I love the idea you're committed to Manchester public schools. And I think that's important for people to note. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily true that if you don't have your kids in public schools that you somehow shouldn't be allowed to run for office. I'm not saying that. But for me personally, um, um, it's very important that people sort of demonstrate a commitment to the city by being in, in uh, I think. The one other baseline thing I'd like to say is because, you know, in the sort of, you know, uh, uh, to have truth and honesty there, um, you're running against the the, the uh, incumbent, Kevin Kavanaugh. Yep, I'm running against Senator Kavanaugh. Right. And, and, and Kevin's a friend of mine. Yep. Uh, but you are too. I'd like to think, and um, and so um, uh, that most people, I think, when they look at this race first, they look at races around the city. When they look at your case, I think they would say, well, I think you know the common knowledge is Kevin just came off of a major win against Dave Putin um, uh, to to become a state senator, um, and then did very well in the primary. Um, I'm not saying you're not without your capabilities and pluses and what you will bring to the to bring to the market but how would you how would you respond to people who would say you're really fighting an uphill battle it's going to be difficult to beat kevin well i what i would say is uh first of all i, I don't know senator kavanaugh very well i i got to know him a little bit uh at the primary day a couple of weeks back we stood next to each other in the polls he was perfectly gracious to me and i like to think that i was perfectly gracious to him um, by all accounts, uh, Senator Kavanaugh loves this city the same way that I do. Uh, I'm proud to be running the race that I'm running, and I'm focused on the issues and staying positive and having a lot of fun. And uh, Senator Kavanaugh is going to run his race, and I'm going to run mine, and we'll see what happens on Election Day. Good. And, and I would say, if I, my, my observation would be this for, for people in the audience, and there are those who will know 
more than I do about you and more no more than I do about I don't claim to be the oracle in any of these things this is just the Jim O'Connell view the pay, the public decides what value that has and if they if they if they overvalue it they're probably uh, they're probably a little silly but it is worth something folks let's see. but um and what I, I what I like about this race is there's an honesty about it because you know Kevin Kavanaugh makes no apologies about who he is politically he is uh, he's liberal in his views um he, you know I I I don't want to put, I hope you wouldn't be upset by this is my view of him. So I view him as, you know, um, a, a reliable, somebody who stands up for what he, be, what he believes in. And I love the idea that he's not wishy-washy and not viable, or, you know. Um, and then when I look at you and I say, you know, in, in Chris Stewart, people who, who are conservative, certainly fiscally conservative, they look at Chris Stewart and they know what they're, they know what they're going to get. And I think so, the, you know, if I was sort of sitting in your seat, the, 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 the strong suit is to say, you know, you've been consistent in your conservatism um, while you were in the school board and other oh, things. Oh, I think, I think absolutely. Look, I, it, your viewers at home should know I am a registered Republican. I am running as a Republican. Uh, I like to consider myself, and I hope that other people consider me to be a strong fiscal conservative. Uh, I certainly think that budgets and numbers need to add up and need to work. Uh, and that we need to be careful stewards of the taxpayer dollars, uh, and we need to be responsible in that. But my other views are, are quite moderate. That you know, the joke that I like to tell my friends is that I'm a, uh, I'm originally from Southern Vermont. I, I grew, I was born and raised in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont, which is in the southern part of the Lovely state. Lovely town. It's I drive great, through it. My great, daughter's up in Syracuse. I, I drive through Brattleboro on the way out. There. Beautiful town. And please don't hold it against me that I'm from Vermont originally and now living here in New Hampshire. But what I like to say is that I'm in the mold of a proud Vermont Republican, which puts me comfortably to the left of the New Hampshire Democrat. Democratic Party. Okay. So, so here <laughs> okay. we are and having this conversation. Well, so it'll be a fu- it'll be a good race and a fun race. Uh, the other thing is, and I don't know, you know, what 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 I might be trading on, you know, how you want to be viewed. But the way I look at it also is, you know, there's sort of an old and a new Manchester. And it's not as though we ever want to reject the old and sort of everything that's old is not right. We, I, I'm not, I'm not a believer that we need a revolution in our politics. That, that we need everybody who's an incumbent is somehow not capable or bad, and you know, they're a net bad. I, I'm not saying I'm not going to those extents, but I do think there are people who have a view, uh, a more enlightened view of Manchester's true possibilities and what it can be. And then there are those who want to hold the line on kind of what we have we will hold and there will be no movement from there um how, how do you see yourself in that oh, I, I i'm running i'm running for really two big reasons and one of the big reasons is because i think that while on the one hand the city of manchester is doing so great in so many ways from either the the growing business community to the awesome restaurants to the wonderful things that are going on down in the mill yard um, the private sector is really booming here in, in manchester but i think at the same time that that's been going on city government has been left behind I think that city government, for the most part, lacks vision, uh, lacks ideas about where it wants to go and how it wants to move this city forward. And and so I'm really running um, along with a couple other people uh, this year to, to shake things up on on the board of mayor and aldermen and and to help the city move forward in a positive a positive direction. Um, so I, I am extremely optimistic about the the future of Manchester, and I and I greatly hope that we can help reform city government and move it move it forward. Okay. So since we're on education matters and we do spread widely, or you know, on this show we do talk about. Of things. I mean, probably 90%, 75%, 80% of what we talk about is education, but we haven't, it's not unknown for us to be dragged into other topics. I'm happy to but, go wherever uh, you want, Jim. Well, and, and I'm happy to be led wherever you would like to lead. My God, what a, what a marriage. <laughs> um, so, uh, so education, right? So I think my, my you know, people who watch, who are watching the show, but they know my, my, my views are sort of well known in this. Uh, so, uh, you know, as an alderman, you are now differently from when you were a school board member. You're going to have your hands on the purse strings. Yep. Um, which, uh, which I, which is clearly uh, uh, where, where, where it's all at. And certainly, when from from my from my uh, worldview. So, um, the question of Manchester School funding. How do you feel about the current funding of Manchester schools and the funding level that it has? And what would you, you know, what what's your take on what needs to change first, and then what needs to change over time? So I, it's a great question. I I believe, and and that along with shaking up city government, the other big reason that I'm running is is the school system and helping reform the schools. And what I have said, and what I truly believe, is that Manchester deserves and can have the best school public education system in the state of New Hampshire. And by doing that, we will attract all sorts of new, young, upwardly mobile families to our communities, which will help this city boom even better than it is today. So I'm focused like a laser beam on 
on trying to make the school district even better than it is today. And I think that you and I can both agree that our school district is nowhere near as good as it as it should be. Right. As on the question on the on the funding, <clears throat> I got this. I had, had this conversation earlier today. Um, I believe that we need to take a hard look at the way that we allocate the current resources in the school district and make sure that those resources are allocated appropriately and efficiently. And when we do that and successfully get to the end of that conversation, then we can figure out, well, do we need to put more new dollars into the system? Because right now it is very unclear if that is the case. One of the statistics that I'm fond of um, talking about, and I talked about this at length on the school board, is that over about the last 15 years, the, the state of Manchester has practically doubled the amount of money that it spends per student. Okay? At the same time that we have doubled the amount of money that we're spending per student in this district, our, our student enrollment has dropped because the sending towns left and other students left. And at the same time that student, enrolling, student, student enrollment is dropping, we are also, our, our dropout rates have remained pretty much unchanged. Our test scores have gone down a little bit. Our students aren't seeing a return on the investment that we're putting into the system. And we need to figure out why that is before we throw more money after the money that we've already put into it. Right. And, and we were doing so well. And, um, and, you know, some marriages last a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and some last a minute and a half. Yep. So, so um, it, it, well, thank you for the answer. I mean, I, I have a much different view, as you could probably imagine. Yep. Uh, but, but I'm not. It's not as though I'm I'm uh, blind and, and that I don't recognize some of the truth in what you're saying. I, I just think that if you know, just you, you lost me just a little bit in this regard. Uh, when you look at what looking looking at our schools a slightly different way, and saying. So what we have done, we have also eliminated programs after program after program, and we've eliminated teachers at a rate that has us now for where we weren't. Like when you were on the school board, we were, I don't remember exactly, but seventh or eighth or somewhere around there from the bottom in terms of number of teachers per student. We're now at the bottom, and we're actually in a category of our own at the bottom. So we've dropped off the bottom into a separate category where our, our number of pupils per teacher is, is it's, it's, it's markedly, markedly different. And, when, and then when, when I, I really dislike the conversation. Do I, I mean, it is important. But I dislike starting with or approaching the area of academic achievements without looking at some of the results. So when you take our middle schools, for instance, and six years ago, we eliminated 50% of the people, of the teachers in the schools who were teaching English. So we used to, the kids used to have two periods a day in, in all or four middle schools. So every student in the city of Manchester during their sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, now so we know the argument should be made about first, second, third grade and how important it is there and there's a challenge there. Had the resources been moved to there, I'd feel somewhat differently. But we went around, we eliminated 50%, which is an amazing number. Now, if we were saying we reduced 25%, we should be shocked. But we took 50% of the teachers away from the kids and 50% of the teaching time. So a sixth, seventh or eighth grader in Manchester now has half the time learning English that they had six years ago. So if you really wanted to use the metrics and be very crude about it, if you want, if if one was, if there was a direct comparison, you would say, well, they should be fifty percent as good at reading. So, without getting buried in the weeds, so to speak, when you eliminate fifty percent of the time for learning, and you only have a drop of ten percent, then that could be seen as a huge plus. I don't think we can solve this like sitting at this table in terms of the, and we lose people in terms of the numbers because there is validity in what you said about the fact that the budget has risen over the fifteen years, but but that can't be the only measure. Just like the people who say to me, saying that we've got the least well-funded school system in the, in, the, in the state, get you so far, but it doesn't say everything. Well, look, I, I think if the question is, do I think that it is extremely sad and a disservice to our students that we stu still have, we have students in portables or did when I was there? Absolutely. Do I think we're doing a disservice to our students when we talk about the lack of high-quality technology in the classrooms? Absolutely. Do I think we're doing a disservice to our students when we talk about that there's a lack of a district-wide... Um, professional development program for our teachers. Absolutely. You know, Dr. Brennan and I, who was the superintendent uh, 
two super two superintendents ago, ago yeah. and I used to have long conversations when I was on the board about professional development. When I was on the board, I think we were budgeting something like a hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars a year for the entire for for the several thousand teachers in our district for professional development. And Dr. Brennan and I were in complete agreement that we should have been spending upwards of two or three or four million dollars on that, and right, significantly right. more resources. Agreed. So it is very it is very true that you can absolutely point at places in our budget where we are doing a disservice to our students because we are not funding appropriately right. the things that they should be getting. Um, but what we need to understand is, and I would argue, um, is that one of the major reasons we're doing that is because we're misallocating our resources. We're not allocating our resources as well as we could in other in the other lines, and those lines, frankly, are, are the salary and benefits um, lines. Which, which of course, make up 80 percent of the entire thing. Close, so, close, yeah, close and to I think I think it's important. I think you know, I you know, as somebody who spent a lot of time trying to bring technology into the schools, and, and parents and parents groups across the city have done a wonderful job in this. And uh, anybody I hear talk about well, parents should pony up. I mean, it's really, pa parents are ponying up all the time and we could sort of demonstrate that. But uh, in the end, the most important thing in any classroom is a, is a competent, high quality e teacher, high quality, point. energetic, excited and well, well trained. Well, exactly. That's, we know that that's the answer. Absolutely. That's what we need. And there's plenty of room for division there, right? Because we could talk about first, pa first in, last out, and all that stuff, and how that affects in tenure, and how, how do we, how do we get to having an energized, well qualified, you know, anxious to work, f you know, great teacher in front of every kid, yep. or, or approach it as much as we can. And there's room for there's room for uh, stuff there. But in the end, you know, you know that 80 percent, that's that is the big number. That's where we are we are at. And that drives us to this issue of, of uh, you know, uh, salary and healthcare and uh, and benefits, whatever the benefits may be, all of it, roll it all together, retirement, healthcare, whatever else you might have. And uh, and I, I, people have, know. I think my concern has always been that that you know. Uh, uh, I think that as citizens, what we would want uh, in the city of Manchester is what we would want is that our that we we have a compensation package such that we can attract good teachers. I mean, if we were attracting teachers all the way from Hawaii, we're probably paying too much. But, you know, we just want to attract. There's nothing wrong with well, Hawaii. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about attracting teachers from outside of New Hampshire. One of the things I fought for and was actually successful at getting on the school board was a travel budget for the Human Resources Department to be able to uh, pay for the airline tickets and the hotel rooms of people that we were trying to recruit from outside the state of New Hampshire. Because you will remember in that education audit from a couple years back that I also helped uh, pass with my good friend uh, Art Beaudry, Commitment Beaudry, uh, one of the things that that audit talked about was the need to attract new teachers into the Manchester School District that were from outside the city of Manchester and, and from outside the state of New Hampshire. So uh, maybe other, if, we're, if, we're, if we're attracting people from Hawaii, it might not be yeah, a bad might not thing. be so bad. And that's and that's got it has, has had its own contentions around it uh, um, uh, over time. One of, sadly, one of the other things we we have in Manchester is because we haven't been hiring to any great extent, and we've been downsizing, not just to, to, because of the elimination of the country towns we've been downsizing in terms of courses etc 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 but and because of the issue of last in first, first out, out so our teacher population is generally older than it would otherwise be yeah. and of course then we look at salary levels and the 14 steps over 14 years for people who don't know the quick version somebody comes into the Manchester school system starts at about $35,000 and then over 14 years gets an increment each year till they get to around 75,000 at the very top end after 14 years and then that's it for there so that's the short version of where they are and um, but if you're not bringing in uh, adequate numbers of new then your population's older means you're paying everybody at the higher rate and the, there's an element of that in Manchester that um, it's just skewed age-wise a little bit and therefore it skews it skewed uh, it skewed uh, money wise um, so uh, so how do we how do we end up getting uh, it's too big a question to, to, to cover all of it the most qualified the best and all the, let's just uh, just in numbers how do we end up with more teachers and that we clearly need um, since we've got the lowest number in the state how do we how do we do that like how do you see that happening uh well that's it you mean more teachers to, to lower the student teacher ratio? ratio how do we do that well i mean i think that uh i believe that all of the classrooms now in manchester are under state standard is that correct Mm, it's it we we won't know until like there's a figure that was done this for not to be hedge on it i think there was a snapshot taken in early september it's much better than it was last year 
because we hire teachers into the elementary schools. Um, the, there, there are classes that are over the state standard. Is I, I, I rebel at the word state standard, but 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 there is a Manchester uh, this thirty per class um, number. So that's I see that as the number that thou shalt not go past. You know, there are those who say, oh, we've met the standard, we're fine. The number thirty was only ever to be like it's dysfunctional at that point. But the, anyway, to answer your question more directly. The best feeling I have for it today is that most classes are under the 30 and there may be, you know, one, two or three percent of classes that are over the 30. But we won't know that till the snapshot in time, you know, because of the fluctuation of numbers. There was numbers to be issued to the, we'll hear it at the school board meeting, next next school board meeting, what the numbers were taken. I think they were probably taken first, to say, maybe, maybe yesterday or else last Friday. Yep. I, look, I mean, Jim, I, I think it's what I've been saying that we need to do both on the city side and the school side in terms of the allocation of resources. I think the first thing we all need to do is sit down uh, the two boards, the school board and the automatic board, the um, school unions and the city side unions, and come to a common understanding about the cost of these salary and benefit packages that have been around for the last 20 years. I mean, Yager Decker, the, the salary and benefit formula that was put into place back in the late 90s, was put into place and was supposed to be reviewed every single year year to make right. sure that it was working properly and we I, to the best of my knowledge we've never reviewed it and so we sort of have this this system that's been on autopilot and it is absolutely playing havoc with all of our city budgets uh, you and I were talking outside in the what you call the green room it was a green, green room with, there's a green green, green carpet door. we got green carpet in here you know I in in, in Chris Stewart's personal opinion um, and I had this conversation, I, I think you remember uh, back when I was on the school board, I was on the negotiations committee, uh, Dave Gelinas, who was then the, the vice chair, put uh, Dr. Avard, Sarah Ambrosi and I on it, uh, with Matt Upton, the lawyer, and we were on this negotiations committee. We worked closely with Ben Dick, who I respect a lot. I think he's a very uh, sharp guy. Um, and sadly, no longer with us. No, he, I know. Sadly, yeah. sadly no moved, longer lives. Moved but, out of town. But was a but was a very good guy, and mm -hmm. we um, we worked for the better part of four months with the unions to try and come to an agreement. And, and what I would say to them is, look, the the health that the, the benefits line in the in the in the school budget is about a fifty million dollar line, and it's increasing at about seven percent a year, completely unsustainable. Um, in my opinion, the lowest hanging fruit is in that line and with very modest changes made to the health care programs of the teachers, you can kick loose a lot of discretionary dollars that you can then turn around and plow back into the school district for computers, for moving kids out of portables, for better playgrounds, for textbooks, for a, for a better teacher-student uh, ratio. Um, and so that's, and that's what I would look at first and then, and then you go from there. But the important thing is, is that everyone's going to have to work together on this and everyone's going to have to turn down the rhetoric and everyone's going to have to agree to try and get along and if we can do that i think that the sky is the limit for what we're trying to do i think that um i, I think that the first uh, thing that uh, we we need to agree on and i mentioned this to you earlier off offline i i think um it's not always discernible, but I think we've moved to a point over the last 10 years or so where there is general agreement, I think, that our schools need, what do you want to call it, re-resourcing, reallocation of resourcing, or whatever, we, or in your terminology, or in mine, you know, they're significantly, uh, uh, fundamentally underfunded anyway. But in either case, if we can agree that there's, dysfunctionality is too strong a word, because I wouldn't have my kids in a system, and you probably wouldn't be putting your kids in a system we felt was right. dysfunctional. But our schools do need, they've been badly served uh, by avoiding the, 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 the topic, you know, some of the hard decisions. So if we can, and we have a new superintendent, and I'm going to ask you in a second how you feel about our new superintendent. We have a new superintendent who, who whether you like him or not, at least is willing to um, bring these subjects up and talk about things about structural uh, deficits and structural deficiencies in our budget, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is the kind of conversation we need to have. Um, we're, we're coming up on the half hour here in uh, in about four minutes, so we have a little bit of time, but let's talk with Dr. Vargas and how you feel about that issue. Well, I, I'll get into Dr. Vargas in a second, but going back to this function thing, look, I think it is very important to stress that there is absolutely wonderful things going on in the Manchester School absolutely. District. I mean, I, I, as you said, I would not be putting my kids into that school district. You wouldn't have 
kept your kids in that school district. And I think that for the kids of Christopher Stewart or the kids of Jim O'Connell or the kids of my friend Sarah Ambrosi, you know, these these are kids that are getting a wonderful, outstanding education and are going on to do terrific things. It is at the district-wide level that we are not doing as good a job as we should do. Um, as to Dr. Vargas, uh, I have not had the pleasure of, of meeting Dr. Vargas yet. Um, I am very uh, friendly and had long conversations with people who know him well, have worked with him, and uh, all of them to a person seem to be very optimistic about the direction that he's taking the school district in. Uh, I have certainly uh, read in the newspaper and watched him at the school board meetings and have been very impressed with what he's done so far. And when I'm alderman, I'm looking forward to working with him closely to, to move the district forward. When we go back to this issue we talked about earlier on about you and Kevin Kevin, I just talked about sort of the forthrightness or sort of not to overplay the word honesty or something, but just like the lack of guile and subterfuge and second meaning and unspokenness and all that yep. stuff. Uh, not that I want to be Mr. Honest John, but I like forthrightness. You know, let's call it like it is, right? And I think that's something. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm still not ready to, to, to tip my hat completely, but I, but from what I see, I see that in Dr. Vargas, that he's willing to be, that, you know, he's, he calls it like it is. And, I, and, and we can work, all of us together, if we're being honest with each other and people aren't um, moving the decks around a little bit. I have to say, just when I think about my, I just want to bring up a little, and this is just a vignette. It's one story of one kid in, in our schools. But just the Jim O'Connell version for a minute, I've got two kids out of the school system doing very well, and I'm very pleased with what, what Manchester School District and all its wonderful people in it were able to do for my kids. And I, I, I appreciated that, and I'm, and I'm grateful for it. But I have two kids left at Central High School. My oldest daughter is a senior. My son is a sophomore. Well, I'll give you a snapshot of my son, the sophomore. So what Manchester School District has done for him is they have given him no foreign languages up until his 14th year. And so that's every other kid. I could go to Merrimack, and I could send my kids to Merrimack, and my, ca my kid can do Spanish, German, French, Latin, Chinese, and Arabic. I can go to Bedford. I can do Mandarin, Chinese, and, the f and four major European languages. At Central High School, my son there is there as a sophomore. So far in his school life in Manchester, at 15 years old, he's had one year of foreign language, and this year he's been told, why don't you go on VLAX and go home and do it on a computer? We don't have a teacher for you because the teacher's only there half a day a week. I mean, half a day each day, and it's shared between him and Memorial. So as a snapshot, and then to give you another snapshot of where we are, when the people go around going rah, rah, rah about our great school district, and I agree with you, there are great things happening, and I would... But just to give you the O'Connell worldview for a minute, which I don't usually do in this show, but just to sort of be forthright about it, last year my two kids at Central High School were in math classes. One had 32, the other had 30. That's the great, the great first in the state, first created high, public high school in the country, in the state of New Hampshire. That's its state of the art in 2016-17, and in 2017-18. My kids had one year, and now he's having VLAX out of his life in Manchester Public Schools. We need to do something to fix all of that. Hey, I totally agree. Look, let me let me just, just go about the foreign language for a second. I took foreign. I was required to take foreign language in middle school. I took Spanish. I wasn't very good at it, but I was required to take it. It was offered at my middle school. I think that foreign languages, Spanish, French, Chinese, whatever, should be offered at starting in the middle schools, and I think our kids should be required to take it because, frankly, we live in a bilingual world, and that's the way that. The, the, I, it's going. I agree. And Dr. in fairness to Dr. Virus, his first anniversary was the 1st of September. He's here one year and a day or two. And uh, and he achieved something we hadn't had for four or five years, um, which other people didn't ring alarm bells about. And what I like about him as part of this honest conversation, again, is he said not having middle school foreign languages was educationally unsound. Chris, we could keep this going for hours, I know. And I'm hoping that uh, whatever happens to you in, uh, you know, happens to you, I would put it another way, however successful you are um, in on November November 7th, and voting is November 7th, and everybody should go out and vote. Um, if you want to give it a wrap-up or whatever you'd like to say to the people watching this show, and particularly, well, the people watching this show. I would, I would just like to say thank you for your time. To your uh, viewers at home, I, again, my name is Chris Stewart. I'm running for Alderman in Ward 1. I would greatly appreciate your consideration uh, for the vote on November 7th, and if I'm elected, I pledge to do the best job I can to make the Manchester School District the best school district in the state and help move this city forward on every other issue that we all care about as a city and so thank you Jim for having me on I really appreciate it thank you Chris it was a pleasure uh, Kirsten if we could take a break for a second and we'll come back to you folks in one minute thank you thanks Chris that was great
Uh, hi, folks, and welcome back after that little hiatus. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, to Chris Stewart for uh, coming in and, and talking with us. And, uh, you know, I make, uh, as I made the point when, I, when he was here um, a moment ago, um, uh, I, he's got a tough race in front of him in Ward 1. Um, uh, Kevin Cavanagh is a great guy and is a good friend of mine. And uh, but I what I like and I like him a lot and I do support him. Um, Chris Stewart, you know, proved himself when he was on the school board. To um, I think the thing I could say about him is that he's his own man. And so I meant when I said when I said that you know he's uh, he's forthright in his views. Um, I think he and I would probably go head to head on many uh, on, on many of these topics. But at least I like I like forthrightness and and uh, and truthfulness, and that that goes a long long way. Because there's too many people, you know, when we're having these conversations. About what's going on in our school district, there's too much uh, pretending. I was talking uh, earlier on, and I was describing a sort of a cartoon view of where we were in the school district six or seven years ago. As we had, you know, in the morning, we ended up with 42 kids in a math class at Hillside Middle School, and we had uh, the uh, candidate for mayor who was uh, Joyce Craig, current candidate for mayor Joyce Craig. Um, who was then a, uh, I think she was a, she was an alderman at that point, and uh, her son was sitting at Central High School, and uh, he actually was sharing a seat. He had he and another kid were sitting with you know half their posteriors, um, uh, one having one cheek and the other having another cheek, sitting on one chair. And, uh, and, 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 you know, this is the day that we, uh, 25% of the staff at uh, Hillside Middle School had been eliminated. We'd fired 160 teachers. Um, we'd eliminated pro unified arts. We'd eliminated by 75%. I don't want to go into the terrible misery of it all. But, you know, shocking, shocking, shocking uh, um, uh, level of uh, cuts within the Manchester Public Schools. It was the, uh, it was a year, uh, within a year of that, the hun many hundreds or hundreds of year and 150 year old traditions of connection between ourselves and Auburn and Candia and Hookset were torn asunder um, and uh, and everything had changed and uh, we were left with the, uh, I won't say the smoking ashes, but we were left with, uh, with a new day in Manchester because... Uh, um, and, and I, I'm sorry to, if to, for those who are too delicate for this, but, you know, we had a mayor who wasn't ever going to go to the people and say this is catastrophic. And uh, we had, of course, f let's, before anybody gets riled up, it took 14 people sitting at a table. And, um, you know, uh, at least five of them had to side with the mayor to override a, a veto. So it's not as though he did it on his own. But that's the mess we did to Manchester back then. And that's fine. I mean, it's not fine. But the part that was most galling about that was the cartoon vision for me was Mayor Gatzes and Tom Brennan, God, God rest him, riding around on the opening day of school in this imaginary open top car doing the royal wave and smiling for the cameras and saying the words, everything's fine, everything's going to be fine. And I, I just was appalled at Mayor Gatz is standing on TV, standing outside Hillside Middle School while there were 42 kids in a classroom and 40 kids in another math classroom, um, you know, rooms bursting at the seams, you know, families packing up their houses in new halls and leaving, 160 of them or, or a lot of them. And I know this is maybe emotional talk and too direct for some of you who've got delicate you know, uh, uh, sensitivities. But that's the mess that was handed to us. And uh, and it's bad enough to do that. If the man and the administration had been honest enough to say, we're decimating your, your proud education system, we're forced to do it by the tax cap, but we believe in the tax cap, we don't believe we can pay any more. So very sadly, we're taking all these opportunities away from your children, and we might even lose a generation. Dr. Brennan, who's departed and is up in heaven listening to me right now, I presume. Dr. Brennan said to me, uh, there's nothing I can do for seven, we've, we're, we're going to lose, as near as I can paraphrase him, because I want to be very honest, I think as near as I can, we're going to lose, there's nothing I can do for seventh and eighth graders or or we're going to lose this, and it was the current 7th or 8th graders, of course, and I happen to have a kid in 7th or 8th grade. But at least privately, which he could never say in a meeting because he would have gotten his head screamed off by the mayor. Um, so uh, privately, he said to me, there's nothing I can do. I can't do anything for the current middle schoolers. It's just 
tough that they find themselves here. So that's the, that's the, you know, if people want, somebody called last week in here and asked me sort of where did I get my opinions from, and I appreciate the question. I don't, I still don't quite understand what the gentleman was asking, but, uh, um, but I took him at his word. I was trying to answer the thing, but you know, if you really want to know something about Jim O'Connell and why he is fired up and why I fight for education in the city, is because of the dishonesty, and you can underline embolden and italicize that word because of the dishonesty of our political leadership at a time when they decimated our public education, tore asunder the fabric of our society where it connected it to Hookset and Auburn and, uh, and uh, Candia, did so by lowering up, wouldn't have a conversation, went immediately to see my attorneys, so to speak, uh, that was the way in which we were going to conduct negotiations with a 150-year-old relationship. Snide, uh, self-righteous, uh, self-assured people on the school board were certain that, oh, you know, I couldn't even have a conversation with them because they would say to me, you just wait and see, they're going to come sniveling back to us. If they could get a better bargain anyplace else, they wouldn't be here. And, and so that was the attitude of the school board. If you saw the pomposity and, uh, and, and short-sightedness um, of some members of the school board at that time who sat out in Hooksett at public meetings or at joint meetings with the board with Candia and defended this ridiculous stance of the city of Manchester where it was not giving, you know, eliminating um, programs left and right in its schools, classrooms, you know, people in portable classrooms, classrooms that uh, that uh, the pupil-teacher ratios were all wrong on, and uh, and there was not even a hint not even a hint of embarrassment or apology or let's talk about it, folks, and we don't want to lose you after 150 years. We'll be able, we'll let, let's try and work on this. No, they had convinced themselves over the previous 10 or 15 years with their own rhetoric, which was the only problem with Manchester is the contributing towns, get rid of them and everything will be solved. Anyway, I don't want to go back to that old time. I've spent too much of it in the last five minutes. But the the, it's important to understand that that's what we had just a short six years ago, and six years ago ain't that long. That was the end of the first term of the Mayor Gatz's uh, uh, mayoralty, and we'd had a couple of terms of Frank Inter before that, downsizing, 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 and tea partying left, right, and center as fast as he could. So that's the background against which um, we are having current conversations. And I am Despite what I said when uh, Chris Stewart was here while ago and I talked about my, just my kids, um, I could get fired up about that. Um, but I do recognize improvement when I see it. We've had improvement um, uh, this uh, summer if you, with a small eye. Um, but I just find that I, there's still just a huge disconnect. The, the lack of understanding about what our schools actually need and what they have. Um, the lack of understanding between what they need and what they have and what the perception of the average public representative, especially our alderman is, there's still a big gap there because they, they just don't get it. Now, there are also a set of people who do get it, but because they're fundamentally opposed to public education anyway, they're not too concerned about it. Because if you look at the list of questions asked by the union leader recently of, of, of candidates for public office, and um, there wasn't a question... They didn't ask candidates a question about what do you want to do about funding our schools. They didn't ask them a question, since we have the least well-funded school system in the state, uh, what do you think we should do about that? You know, it, 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 I, I think it's clear to see when, when, you, when you see people who want to discuss um, the same old, uh, you know, canards, the same old um, uh, topics all the time. And so they want to talk about uh, parental notice. And when they want to talk about parental notice, ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear. You know, there's a uh, there's a meeting being had someplace for um, for uh, uh, whatever a group of uh, candidates, um, conservative candidates for education for the school board of education, school board, uh, and uh, they're they're being asked to answer a set of questions prior to this meeting. And the questions are about uh, sex education in schools. Um, uh, federal government um, uh, doing any uh, uh, surveys of uh, of standards, etc. Um, that they want. To, so their parental notice is really about all these all these issues. Um, they're not asking for parental notice around if my kid is in a class with more than thirty kids in it. I demand parental notice. 
no, they're not too interested in that. They don't talk about that. Um, if my kid um, has only got uh, one quarter of the year in this subject where he used to ha- be able to do it all year, um, I'd like parental notice about that. Mm. No, not so much. They're not too interested in that. So, so yeah, pack them in there. You know, we can have the biggest classes in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, we can spend less on our students than everybody else. We won't need any parental notice for that. But, you know, if you really want to teach some book, you know, like, I don't know, uh, Huckleberry Finn, oh, that's, that's too, uh, that, we can't have that, you know, that's too controversial a book, and I don't want my kid learning this, that, and the other thing. You know, we've had public representatives in Manchester go on and, and read ad nauseum in a mocking voice, you know, books, just the most obnoxious thing you ever heard, um, because they didn't like the fact that a book had been written by... Um, you know, written in English in a story, but it was a story about uh, about a kid who had uh, come to the United States and was was uh, ended up picking fruit or vegetables in farms on the West Coast. And uh, it was a little short story uh, about this little girl's life. And uh, one of our public representative ma- representatives in Manchester thought it was uh, thought it was worth mocking and ridiculing um, in a mock Spanish voice because uh, he didn't like what. Um, he didn't like what he was uh, what he was seeing. So um, when I look at what these people are interested in and want to talk about, of course I I'm, I'm interested in in these things to some degree. But but why are you not appalled by the fact? Like I mentioned, my son who has had one year of foreign languages. He's a sophomore in high school, and uh, and this year he's gonna he's gonna go back out and do it on uh, do it on Vlax. and um, and yet we know that. Uh, universities require uh, three years of foreign language in order to go into many programs. You, you're not going to get into social studies and uh, uh, etc. if you don't have three years of uh, of foreign language. And um, well, my son's going to be hard put to get it. He'll get it because he has uh, he has parents and people around him who are going to ensure that he does it. But he's going to be doing it at home on a laptop, and uh, and not not have the benefit of a publicly paid. Um, Manchester a school teacher to help him with it, and uh, shame on us. Um, we live through it. Uh, we'll be fine. But where does that leave the kid who goes home? You know, we have a homeless problem in our schools. Believe it or not, ladies, for those of you sitting at home comfortably, having your second cup of coffee in the evening, and uh, if you can wipe the spaghetti and meatballs off your mouth for a second as you're watching this, and think of there are kids who don't have that, and there are kids who are going home to one room apartments with like four people in it. And there are people going home who don't, who've got lots of people who are in houses that don't have an internet connection. And uh, so those kids at 13 and 14 and 15 are going to be asked, and at a lot younger if they're in middle school, are going to be asked to go to the, to the local library, which is open like half time if you go to the west side, um, and sit there uh, and, uh, and try and make do that way. And so is it any wonder then? I, I don't. I mean, any disrespect to Chris Stewart, I, I like the guy. As I said, I consider him a friend of mine. I, I, uh, I, I don't like, you know, obviously we disagree on some of the politics thing. But, you know, if we want to talk about dropout rates and uh, that we haven't had so, seen improvements there and, uh, and academic outcomes, then, you know, you can't, um, you can't disassociate one from the other. You can't be doing this to kids and then at the same time measure them um, I think uh, the honest thing to do is to take some ownership of uh, of what we're uh, of of what we're we're actually doing. Um, a few things I just wanted to mention uh, tonight was that um, I made a quick note. There's a few things going on um, up at uh, Central High School. There's a book fair on this week all week, and I went in there today, and it's in the lobby as you walk in, and they're selling uh, softback books at fifty cents each and hardback books at a dollar and. I think it's like three for two bucks or something. Anyway, but there were an amazing number of books there. Um, the money is uh, the money is there. It's been done by the National uh, English Honor Society, and uh, I believe it's going to benefit the, the library um, at at uh, one of the schools. I know uh, whatever books aren't going to be used are going to be donated to the middle schools, but uh, where appropriate. But um, but that's a uh, that's a uh, a wonderful uh, a wonderful uh, fundraiser. So anybody in the central area that's around, and you want to get some bargain books, um, 
I know that there's a college uh, fair on there. There's a lot of things going on tonight. There's a college fair on uh, on there tonight um, for central parents, and that's on from six to eight o'clock. So if you're watching this live, you have you have uh, about an hour and ten minutes to uh, to uh, to get there. Um, the uh, the um, what else is on? Yeah, so there is a, and then there's a parents meeting tomorrow night at six or six thirty at at, uh, at uh, Central High School uh, for parents there. I'm sorry, I'm Central based right now, but um, those are a few things that are going on. And then of course there's no week, no school on Monday for uh, for the uh, weekend. So. Uh, um, there's a bit of a break there for kids who are you now into at the end of their first month of school have been working hard and they're and they're ready to uh they I think they're ready to appreciate this uh this break. Um just as I'm covering a few things another thing that's important to note that I like to do as time goes on here um uh the the whole idea the Aspen um you know parents um, going online to uh, to the to the Aspen system to look at what their um, what the, how their kids are doing. Um, it's 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 an important uh, asset, and so um, I think um, it keeps everybody on their toes, so to speak. And uh, and it means that you don't get any nasty surprises at the end of a quarter, or the end of a semester, with a report that is not as good as you would like it to be. And um, I know that. I've said this many times about how we we go through the year by 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 looking at it at least I do a chunk of time at, at, as we go along and so here we are at the end of the first month of school heading into week 4 into week 5 now um this is a wonderful time for for parents to step in and see how little Mary little Johnny are doing and if they're slightly subpar somewhere you know Sadly, if they're very subpar, I mean, it's best to find it out now. You can take correct, uh, corrective action. As you proceed through the uh, the first quarter, uh, it gets harder and harder and harder to, to take correct, corrective action. And I think kids themselves sometimes find themselves, you know, where they start to flounder a little bit, especially when they're younger and the challenges of school start to increase first um, in middle school and seventh and eighth grade especially, Um you know, it's good for everybody and, and uh, to pay attention. And there's no question in my mind when I look at the parents that I see at the end of the uh, at the end of the people's career when they get to the senior year or junior year in high school, and the parents you see standing around at award nights or whatever it might be, um, there aren't too many surprises there in terms of um, it breaks down mostly about the parents who are involved or who care. Maybe that's putting it too strongly because I'm not seeing. I don't, I think everybody cares. Uh, let me take that back. But the parents who have taken a proactive approach, kids are kids. We all make mistakes. Kids make mistakes more than more than hopefully those of us who are older have learned some uh, have learned from our uh, from our mistakes. So um, unless you've got an extraordinary kid who's very driven and very organized and very determined, um, they're likely to fall from grace someplace. And as parents, we need to be aware of that and be there to support them and help them. And one of the ways you can do that is by using a resource that is given to us by our school district, which is the ability to go in on an hour by hour, day by day, week by week basis, and look at how your kids are doing, broken out by subject, etc. And then, um, and then the answers to 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 whatever you might find is not, please. It is not to go on Facebook and ask questions of your neighbor about, oh, what am I going to do with Mary? You know, the, the, you can do whatever you want, but the people who, it drives me nuts, ladies and gentlemen, when I see things, you know, being being expounded upon on Facebook, and the answer is simple. You say, like, did you ask the teacher? That's the first place to go. If there's, if there's a problem, you know, the first thing you do is just send an email to the teacher or send, send a voicemail. Um universally i have never had a teacher that i wasn't able to contact in the manchester school system you know they they'll respond you send them some respond faster and than others and some are better than others at it but they all respond so the answer is to go and uh, and ask them um you know in the first and if you're not satisfied with that answer of course then you go to the vice principal or principal and you get your answer there um but uh, but the first thing to do is to go in and uh, to go in and look. I'd like to um, there's there's a, there are a number of uh, of uh, uh, meetings coming up um, 
in the coming weeks that I was uh, going to touch off, but we'll have to wait until next week. We're going to have a candidate in here each uh, Tuesday until we get out to, uh, which is only a month away now, right, or a month and a few days away until we get to Election Day. And uh, again, as I was saying when Chris was here, any candidate for office who would like an opportunity to come and uh, and uh, come before you for half an hour, please uh, contact me. I'd be uh, I'd be very happy to uh, to talk to them. Um, so we are in election season. There is a uh, a meeting tonight of the board and mayor and alderman. It should be interesting. We'll see where it goes. Um, sadly, I've got multiple things on tonight, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it. Um, but uh, that's just the nature of the beast. But I do want to talk about the election thing for a minute because um, I hate uh, two-facedness, dishonesty, uh, duplicity. You know, I just it, it, some people would say it's the nature of politics, and I don't accept that it's the nature of politics. I, I accept that we have to live in the real world, but I think that there is. Uh, you know, people have to be able to look at themselves in the mirror, and uh, you know. Um, when when this is all over, so um, to this regard, I you know people are were fired up in recent weeks and months. Um, there was a big anti Ron Ludwig thing going on, and Chris Hebert about something else, and people were you know talking about, and they continue to talk about people breaking the charter because of voting. Um, in, uh, for, in self-interest. And this issue is around the, the issue of Ron Ludwig, Barbara Shaw and, uh, and Alderman Gamache who voted for uh, to approve uh, contracts um, f- when they had a member of their household, a son, a daughter, a wife or somebody who was covered by that contract. And uh, some people believe that that's a prima facie case of breaking the charter and oh this is terrible that they've done this i've explained previously and i don't want to visit it too long here again today but my worldview is that if your son or daughter is going for the window washing contract at uh, city hall and uh, you vote on it then clearly you're voting for the interests of your son or your son's company and that's not right and that would be breaking the charter clearly also clearly on the other extreme, if you vote for the for any rule for the city that says, you know, here's what the tax cap number is, anything that's citywide or covering a lot of the city, you know, that only covers property owners, it doesn't cover all the people who are not property owners directly, I mean, I understand the other argument. But you could say that, oh, you're a property owner in the city, you're breaking the contract because you voted for uh, to increase taxes or decrease taxes on a, pro- a city that you have a property in. So that's the other extreme. I think everybody recognizes that that's not breaking the charter. So the question is, which isn't resolved by the charter, is if you vote for a contract for the firefighters, for instance, and you have a son or a daughter or a brother-in-law who's a member of the fire department, and there's two or three hundred of them in the city, um, are you breaking the charter or not? And that, I think, is open genuinely to interpretation. But what, what, what really bugs me is there's a decision going to be made tonight by the board mayor and alderman about a development in the south side of the city off of Mammoth Road. And uh, Soho Development, Tim Soho, by all accounts, a wonderful guy who who builds wonderful properties. And this is not about him or about his wonderful company, because everything I know about him is that it's a very reputable company. Uh, But uh, it's amazing to me that the people who want to talk about... um, want to talk about uh, Ron Ludwig voting for a contract that his uh, son or or wife was affected by. Um, There's no element of outrage about the fact that Soha company makes a donation of $10,000 to Mayor Gatsis' re-election campaign. 10,000 greenbacks, schmackaroonies, not 50 bucks, not a, a free meal, you know, not a, not a, a voucher for, you know, six months of food over at Creamland. No, $10,000 of a donation to the Gatsis campaign. And Mayor Gatsis is sitting tonight at a board of mayor and alderman meeting where the decision is going to be made about whether to rezone a, um, a piece of land that, uh, that the Soho company wants to uh, build multifamily housing on in the South End. Th- that, that's not a problem. Uh, but you're, I, I, it just, it's just the, the duplicity, the two-facedness, the, the downright dishonesty of it, the uh, you know, not being able to see the woods for the trees-ness of it is, uh, it's just disingenuous and dishonest. I find it appalling, 
political games. Um, you know, people who want the same people as this, they also want to talk about parental notice and why don't we have parental notice in our schools. But a, a young lady being raped at West High School and nobody knowing anything about it for two years, well, that's okay. That's sort of, you know, we, we've got all the reasons for that. That's fine. Um, there's something radically wrong with this picture, ladies and gentlemen, and we need to be paying attention to it. The beautiful thing about our country and our city and our state is that uh, people get to make a choice. And on November the 7th, you can choose whether you want pay-to-play politics, so you pay the mayor $10,000 or the mayor's campaign $10,000, and then you hope for the best that it has a result. Um, or if you like that, then you know how to vote. And if you don't like that, then you should stand up and do something about it. And and people just using the right rhetoric and telling you what you want to hear um, is not uh, is not the way in which to vote. You need to pay attention, look at these things and say, this is not right. And so um, I make no apologies about the fact that I am ready for a change in Manchester, have been ready for a change for a long time. Um, and I think that uh, Joyce Craig is, is uh, going to uh, be a breath of fresh air in City Hall. I'm not hiding from that. Um, but uh, I do look at uh, people who, uh, who who uh, who have a problem with people on one side and are just uh, are just un uh, un unwilling to uh, unwilling to uh, speak uh, speak the truth. I don't think we've got time to take this caller because we're coming to an end. I'm sorry, caller. Um, we'll have to do it uh, next week. Um, thank you for your time tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for spending time on uh, uh, education matters, and we'll see you all again next week. Thank you and good night.